Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 473rd episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Summer is upon us here in Phoenix, and it's hot. With more people getting skin cancer these days, I'm not willing to take chances with the sun anymore. Before I introduce today's podcast guest, I want to share with you how I stay cool and comfortable working in the summer heat. My number one strategy is wearing lightweight, breezy, sun-protective clothing, like cool, moisture-wicking shirts and hats that shade my head, ears, and the back of my neck. I partnered with Gemplers.com to handpick my personal favorite sun-protective wear, and you can see them at Gemplers.com forward slash urban farm. That's Gemplers, G-E-M-P-L-E-R-S dot com slash urban farm. When you use the code urban farm zero one, you get 20% off your first order. Heidi and I use these essential items on this list every day on the urban farm. Check them out and stay cool this summer. Today on our podcast, we have someone who expanded his growing options through hydroponics and more. We're talking with Kevin Espiritu about small space urban gardening techniques. Living in a condo in 2011, Kevin didn't have the space for a big backyard, soil-based garden, so he got creative. Learning about urban gardening was an eye-opening event for Kevin, and as a self-admitted geek and someone with an obsessive personality, he got hooked. He started building his own bizarre, his word, not mine, hydroponic system with amazing results. And when his friends and family wanted to learn to do the same, Kevin was in business. Epic Gardening began as a way to present gardening information in a more modern, updated way. First, the website, next YouTube, a daily podcast, and then Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest. Kevin is an author of Field Guide to Urban Gardening from our friends at Quarto Publishing. Welcome to the show today, Kevin. Are you ready to rock epic gardening? I sure am, Greg. What's up? Excellent. Thanks for being here. And I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Sure. Yeah, it it really is just anyone's path, I guess you could say. Anyone who gets into gardening later in life. Unlike many people who've probably been on the show, I did not grow up as a gardener. I was kind of just a suburban Southern California kid who liked to skateboard and collect rocks and collect bugs. So I guess I I did have a bit of a nature Uh bend to me early on in, in my life. But gardening really didn't come to me until later in life, as you mentioned, when I was living in that condo townhouse. And I just picked it up with my brother one summer after he had gotten out of college for the summer. And we just he said, hey, let's go down to the nursery. We'll we'll see what we can do. And we did pretty much what anyone else would do when they first start. You grab some pots, you grab some soil, probably grab like a miracle Grow variety at the time. And, right. And it's all in pots. He did that. I actually decided to get a little more ambitious. And I did hydroponics in containers because, as you mentioned, I thought that I didn't have any space. And I now know that's not really true. But at least at the time, I said, you know what? I don't have a lot of light, so I might as well grow hydroponically so I can you know, control the whole environment and, mm-hmm. and actually provide light to the plants. So that's how I started out. It was not the most successful journey <laughs> into the hydroponic world as a first timer, as, as you can imagine. But I definitely learned a lot and, and it hooked me. And that's kind of when I decided to start Epic Gardening as a, a little hobby blog that is, of course, now since evolved to much more. And you started Epic Gardening blog when? Well, officially, I would say 2013. Perfect. And how has it evolved since then? So back then, it was really just a hobby blog, just a way to chronicle what I'd been doing in the garden and share a little bit about hydroponics. But pretty quickly, I realized that there wasn't a lot of good information or at least palatable information, I guess, about hydroponics online. I felt that so much was just either buried in research papers or about growing one particular type of plant. And I think you can imagine which one that might be. So I decided to go ahead and just evolve the website a little bit and mm-hmm. create a little bit more of a an actual true resource. And so that that's what I did. And the path has really been it slowly building over time. I, I kind of woke up and realized, oh, there's actually quite a few people reading this. So let's see what I can do and, and actually see if I can turn these avocation into a vocation. And how's that worked? It's been pretty good so far. So I, I officially went full-time on Epic Gardening in 2016, the summer of 2016, so we're right around the three-year anniversary, I guess. So I've been going at it strong for three years. It's pretty good. You do this full-time. What does that look like? 
So in the practical sense, it basically looks like living a life in the garden, which I think a lot of people oh, would, nice. would love to do. But yeah, right? It, wouldn't that be nice? And especially for me, I, I'd experimented with a couple different models in the past where I was actually growing and selling produce. That's not what I do. I used to grow and sell microgreens, and I quickly realized that you know if I wanted to travel around or if I wanted to perhaps take a little bit of a vacation, that would be hard to do. Yeah. And so although growing and selling your produce, I, I completely respect and admire that profession. It's not the path I took. So the route I went is is basically becoming a, a everyman garden educator, I guess is what you would call me. Mm-hmm. And basically, I just share what I'm up to. And it's at the point now where enough people are kind of following along with the journey that I'm able to monetize that in a couple different ways. I sell some products. I'll do some work with brands that I really love and respect. I'll, of course, write the book, which which helps out. And then, you know, sometimes you have a little bit of income coming in from other sources. Right. Well, and as farmers, that's really what happens. You know, I've been self-employed since 2013 doing this and part-time employed for the previous 25 years. And for me, there was always... Okay, I I taught at Arizona State University, and I made a little bit of money doing that, you know. And then there was a few other things. So I think that's as food growers, that's part of the process, is it not? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think even in some of the farms that I'll go out and see, because one of the things I really love to do is go cover other people in the urban gardening movement. I was just out in a farm in Reno, and just seeing all the different ways that he's able to monetize and make a living on his farm, you really do have to pull from a bunch of different sources and kind of the aggregate of all those revenue streams is what enables you to, to do the, the work that you really love to do. That's yeah. what I've seen, at least. Amen to that. Well, yeah. You were doing something before this that maybe you didn't love? Well, it's not that I didn't love it. It's just that I'm such a self-driven person that it's really hard to employ me, and I'm somewhat <laughs> unemployable, I would say. Yeah, I am, too. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so self-motivated that that actually is a detriment. I'm not saying that as, oh, I'm, look at me, I'm so special. It's, it's more of a detriment sometimes when working with teams. So even though I was at a publishing company for 18 months on the founding team and it, it grew like a rocket ship, even that, which would have been a dream job for many people, about, the, about at that 18-month mark, I was like, mm, it's time for me to go out and, and do something on my own because I I just can't handle what would even be considered a pretty good job. Yeah. Well, there was something that happened at the publishing company that kind of blew you this direction, isn't there? Yeah, well, I mean, I worked with Mel Bartholomew in my past. And so I would say right around the 2013-2014 mark is when I was working with Mel Bartholomew. And I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners know him as the founder of, of Square Foot Gardening. Yep. So having worked with him prior to the publishing company and then worked in the publishing company and saw, okay, here's how books are created. Here's how books are launched. Could I potentially write one myself? You know, the, the seeds, metaphorically and literally, I guess, were, were being planted for the future, which, which we're in now. Yeah, and so Mel Bartholomew, I got to like put on the brakes and do a screech here. <laughs> you got to work with Mel Bartholomew? Yeah, yeah. So it was really funny because it was one of those scenarios where if I knew about him at the level that I do now, uh-huh. I would have I would have freaked out more than I did back then because <laughs> I was just getting started, right? right. So to me, he was just someone in San Diego but he was looking to just expand his his digital presence because at that time he was long retired and he'd been focusing on the Square Foot Gardening Foundation, the nonprofit arm. Mm-hmm. And so he hired me to help out with the, the website work and all that stuff. But looking back, I, I now think, wow, what an amazing opportunity to get to sit side by side every day with one of the people who really put gardening on the map for the average man or woman. Yeah, Top 10 in the probably in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Actually, it's funny in, in the publishing world, selling 2 million books, which I think he's very close to, or if not has, has surpassed by now, puts you in the same category as books like Twilight or, you know, all these famous bestsellers. And, and to do that in gardening is really something incredible. Yeah. No kidding. So, what was it like working with him? That had to be fascinating. Yeah. It was really cool. I think it shaped a lot of the way I approach gardening as well. Coming at it later in life, of course, you're not sort of in doctrine with the old-fashioned wisdom, but at the same time, working with someone like Mel causes you to even rethink traditional approaches even more because his whole book was kind of breaking some of the gardening mythos or some of the classic tried and true wisdom and saying, oh, why don't we just strip out all the jargon and and let's do it in this simpler way? Mm -hmm. And clearly that struck a chord. And so that's kind of the way that I try to approach it now is, okay, how can I explain gardening topics and concepts in in simpler ways that don't require a horticulture degree or a master gardener certification to understand? Yeah, exactly. Wow. 
How cool. Yeah, I'm almost speechless here. That To be able to work <laughs> with somebody of his uh, caliber for as long as you did, that would be a life-changing experience for me. So congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. It was definitely a, a pleasure and an honor. So in your bio, we mentioned a bizarre hydroponic project. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that is a bit of a throwback to the cucumbers that I started out with, which would be the hydroponic is a deep water culture system. So basically what you're doing there is you go to Home Depot, you get a Rubbermaid tote, maybe 18 gallons or so, fill that up with water and some hydroponic nutrients, which can be organic or synthetic. And what you'll do there is you'll then put an air stone in the bottom, Mm -hmm. kind of like an aquarium with like a bubbler because you need the, the water to be oxygenated. You need a lot of dissolved oxygen in that water. And then what you'll do is any plant you're growing, the roots will drop down into that solution. So think about it. It's getting water, it's getting nutrients, and it's getting oxygen, which is those are the three main things that a, a root system needs. Right. And it's getting them directly to the source. It's not having to hunt it down. And so things in a hydroponic system like that, again, that's called deep water culture, will grow drastically faster than a soil counterpart. Not that I have anything against soil. In fact, 90% of what I do today is soil gardening. However, there is something to be said for the raw speed of a hydroponic system. Well, and also there's, they use less water, I would guess. Oh yeah, drastically less water. I think the stat is somewhere around 90% less. And that's mostly because you're not getting evaporation, right? Because the the system is enclosed and the roots are only using the water that they need. So the rest of the water just sits there. It, it doesn't evaporate out. It doesn't seep through the bottom of the soil and the roots are just able to use it. So it's very, very water efficient. So really good if you're in a drought area. Like we both are. Yeah, both of us are, exactly. Yeah. So you can use that. And of course, there's things in soil you can do as well. But, but it's very helpful for greens, I would say. If you're, if you're looking to grow a lot of greens in a really enclosed space in mm-hmm. a simple system, hydroponics would be something I would look into. Yeah. Well, you know, I've said for several years now that growing food in cities, I call it urban farming, but growing food in cities is the solution to our food problem. And it's not just in ground. It's not just hydroponics. It's not just aquaponics. It's everything. You know, it's the whole, all of the systems that we put in place in cities to make food. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that what you said is really accurate. I think sometimes you'll see these, I guess you could call them battles between the methodologies of, oh, is aquaponics really that efficient versus hydroponics or soil or vertical, whatever. And in my opinion, I think we need a little bit of all of them customized to the unique challenges of each growing environment. Exactly. Sometimes something will just work better. Yeah, exactly. One of your early ventures was a, a microgreens business. Tell us about that and tell, tell us your experience and uh, how that worked. Sure. So that was, I would say, 2014, in the summer of 2014, which was a couple years into my gardening journey. And I had picked up a kit for growing different types of microgreens, maybe four or five different types, red garnet, amaranth, some very colorful varieties. As soon as they started coming up in the trays, I looked at them and they were just so vibrant and absolutely delicious. And so my entrepreneur brain kicked in and I said, (laughs) I wonder if a restaurant would want to buy these. And so what I did is I called my cousin and I said, hey, take a day off work. I'm going to go get a haircut, look nice and fresh. And we went to one of the nicer streets in San Diego with all the fancy restaurants. Uh And I just put the microgreens on ice, made up a little price sheet on Microsoft Word And then we walked down that road for the afternoon. So I went in at about 2 to 3 p.m., which is a really good time to go in if you're trying to network with a chef because Mm -hmm. it's in between service. So they're just prepping and you're not going to bother them or, or, you know, disrupt service in any way, which is a surefire way to not get the deal. Yeah, don't go at lunch or dinner. Yeah, exactly. So we went in and pitched them. It took a long time and we weren't really getting a lot of success until we got to the last restaurant on the road, which was coincidentally the fanciest, the most prestigious. And so I was kind of discouraged. And my cousin said, you know, it's not going to hurt us to just go into this last one. So we go in and the two sous chefs come out and they absolutely love every single microgreen. And they asked for 10 others that I didn't even have. And so I was kind of flabbergasted, didn't Uh know what to say. And my cousin stepped in and he said, you know what? Perfect. We'll have these ready for you in two weeks. And so then I said, I said, thanks for saving me. And I went home and I next day aired the seeds, started them on that following day. And then for the next six to nine months, I had that restaurant as well as a couple others in San Diego as regular clients, which was just really a really fun way to make a living with plants. Mm-hmm. Not a living, I guess. It was more of a side income thing, but it certainly could have scaled up to be a living. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, Joseph at Arizona Microgreens here in Phoenix does a local microgreens and he scaled it up into 
a pretty big business, just local. Yeah. Yep. Microgreens can be a, I would say, two to eight thousand dollar a week business, depending on the level of scale. Yeah. And of course, it depends on your market too. You did say a week. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's just what I know from different people that I've went around and, and hung out with. It, it really just depends on your your locale, right? San Diego yeah. much bigger, of course, than than a, a smaller town like a Santa Barbara, right? right. So it, it really is going to depend on on that city that you're in. Well, you know, I lo- I really love the way that you did it. You really before you grew anything of you know any significance, you went around and talked to the chefs, found out what they wanted. That's that's a key piece of your success. Yeah, I think, and this gets a little bit far afield of gardening, but it, it does speak to you know entrepreneurship or, or making a business out of plants in general. Is the qu- quicker you act to see if the idea will work, the better off. If I had sat there and scaled up, spent a couple thousand bucks on microgreen equipment, and then then went to restaurants and found that oh they don't really want them, or <laughs> right. they don't want them at the what, what? Why did I waste all that time? I might as well find out right away, get a couple contracts, and mm-hmm. then go from there. It, it's much easier to to have success that way. Yeah. Well, congrats on that. Thanks. Yeah, it was fun. So you've written a book called Field Guide to Urban Gardening. I have a copy of it here. In fact, we're going to give away some of these to our listeners. Tell me about the book. This is a it's first of all, it's a beautiful book. It's oh, thanks. well laid out. Quarto does a, you know, a great job of, you know, presenting content. Tell me about the book. Yeah, so the book came about through actually Shauna Coronado, who oh. I'm pretty sure you've had on your show, right? I have, and she actually now lives in Phoenix, the Phoenix area. So Oh no way. Oh yeah, she moved out to Arizona, huh? Yep, she did. Yeah, so I met her and then she connected me to Quarto, which coincidentally bought up Cool Springs Press, which is the publisher that published Mel's book. And so ah. having that square foot gardening connection and having Shauna's connection made it really nice and, and fun. And of course, working in publishing was kind of a no-brainer to put a book together. And so what I decided to do was put a book together that I thought would be a bit of a twist on what I consider to be the classical gardening books. And what's really weird about my book is that inside it, there is no guide at all on how to grow any specific plant. So there's no tips on tomatoes. There's no how to prune your basil. The The goal of the book, the first third is basically how do plants grow in general? What are the principles behind growing things in general that you need to know so that you can start to solve these individual plant issues yourself? You know, if you know how plants use water, light, how, you know, to space them, all sorts of all these sorts of things, then you can start to think on your own and solve the rest of the gardening problems by yourself instead of always looking somewhere else for these very specific things like when to prune a tomato or how much light does a tomato need? All these sorts of questions, right? Mm-hmm. Then what I decided was was I heard from so many people that messaged me on YouTube or Instagram or email and says, man, I love what you're doing. I just can't really do it where I'm at. And I'll ask them where they're at. And 97% of the time, it's a space that they can definitely grow in. They just don't have the tools or the knowledge, right? right. And so middle section of the book is six different growing methods. So you've got container gardening, raised beds, vertical, growing indoors, hydroponics, and then balconies and rooftops. And that's my attempt to say, hey, no matter where you live, there's going to be something in this section that you can grow. At the very least, you can grow some sprouts and microgreens on your kitchen counter, right? That's like the bare minimum. And, and if you don't have a kitchen counter, then I would question where you're living in general because <laughs> right. where, where are you? You know, Even in a dorm, you could do a little windowsill. So. Yep. Uh, then the final third of the book is is trying to curtail some of the problems that first time gardeners run into. I, I think the stat is forty percent, so four in ten people who start gardening don't do it the next year and don't do it again, right? So they're first time gardeners. They garden for a year, that's it, and they're out. And uh, a lot of my friends in in my normal non gardening life are like that. And so I decided, okay, what are the most common pests, most common diseases, and the most common mistakes that gardeners make in their first year that prevent them from gardening again because they just get discouraged. And so that's what that final third of the book is all about, the growing problems that you might run into. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Nice. So I'm thumbing through the book here. And on page 78, you have a really cool project here. And it's super simple. It's a self-watering five-gallon bucket. Tell me mm. about that project. Because literally anybody with a little bit of you know patio space could build one of these and grow a tomato plant or greens in it. Yeah, a hundred percent. So the the five gallon bucket is is another one of those projects where maybe you don't want a five gallon bucket sitting in your front yard and you don't think that's aesthetic. 
However, the, the principles of that project, you could apply them to any container. I personally enjoy growing in five-gallon buckets, and, and a lot of people, it's just a method that they really prefer. But the idea there is you're just creating a chamber at the bottom of the five-gallon bucket that wicks water upwards. So you're separating the water at the bottom, maybe a couple inches of water as a reservoir, from the soil above, which fills up the rest of the bucket. And then you're connecting those two sections with a piece of t-shirt or an old rag, just something to wick that water into the soil. And then via capillary action, it's just going to wick upwards through the soil to the roots. And so you're watering from the bottom instead of the top. And what you're doing there is you're just ensuring that you have nice, consistent, moist soil that your plants are going to love. And you have to water less, which means you're less likely to make mistakes by forgetting or watering too much. So it's a pretty simple project, but I mean, people use that in, in commercial applications even to grow at, at large scale. Yeah. Well, and in the book, do you have a favorite? A favorite project? I would say the one that I really love just because I've seen so many people actually go out and build it and, and send me their pictures is the, I think I call it the world's easiest raised bed. And it's just two by sixes and these planter blocks, almost like a Lego set where yep. you slot the two by sixes into the planter blocks on the corners. There's no tools, there's no nails, no brackets, no anything. So it's really good. If you're a renter, like actually I am, you can just throw one of these together. And then when you leave, you don't even have to unscrew it. You can just take the pieces, put it in your car, move it, and then put some soil in the next place. And now you have another garden. Yeah. Well, and, and you frame out a lot of really cool, simple things in your book, ways yeah. to garden. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal is, is how many different ways can I hook someone, right? So if you're not into raised beds, maybe you'll be into containers, right? And if maybe you're a more sciencey minded person who likes a little bit more control, then go ahead and hit the hydroponic section. So my goal was how many different people can I suck into the world of gardening? And, and you know, not, we're not all the same. And for me, it took hydroponics to get me into it in the first place. And for other people, it's house plants. For other people, it's, it's microgreens. And so I try to give as many options as possible. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. The book is called Field Guide to Urban Gardening by Kevin Espiritu. You can get it on Amazon, I'm sure. You can check out our show notes page at the end of the show as well. So in June, you took on a project. Tell us a little bit about the project and uh, to whet our appetite, because I know we're bringing you back to talk more fully about it. Tell us about your your sure, epic June yeah. project. So, yeah, that's called Apocalypse Grow. That's what I decided to call it. And it mostly came about because my friends and I are always debating, like, what would you do if there was a meteor strike or if something happened where society kind of collapsed? And, and I was always telling them, hey, you guys would need me because without me, uh -huh. you're not making it past the first year. You know, yep. like, people like you and I, Greg, are invaluable in, the, in a world-ending scenario. We actually know how to grow food, right? I'm like most people. <laughs> right. And so then I said, you know what? Let's see how far I can get living off my own food in, in one month. How Can I actually do this? And keep in mind for everyone listening, I'm growing in an urban setting in about 150 to 200 feet of actual growing space, 200 square feet, sorry. And that's not a lot, right? I'm a big guy, 6'4", 225 pounds. I need a lot of food. And so I gave myself three months lead up time and tried to do it. And, and we're actually recording this after the challenge. So thankfully, I, I have survived and I've made it through. But the goal and the rules were, I can only eat for an entire month what I grow, what I've fished out of our oceans, what I've foraged for, of which there isn't a lot in San Diego in the summer, right. and what I've bartered for. And if I barter with someone, I, I can only barter something that they've grown or produced themselves. I can't go trade them some potatoes and get a Domino's pizza, right? Because that would kind of defeat the purpose. Yeah. So those were the rules. And I had a 30-day 30, 30 period in which I had to survive. And, and it was just a really fun challenge to go through. Awesome. And we're going to have, like I said, we're going to have Kevin come back and we're going to dig in deep to the challenge to see how it worked and how well you fared because, you know, you sound great after the fact. So you must have been done pretty good. Yeah. I will say the first week was incredibly hard on my, my mind mm -hmm. just because I was coming off, if you really think about it, if I could only eat what I grew, fish, forage, or barter, that means no meat, no gluten from from breads because I wasn't growing any wheat to produce a flour, right? Right. Uh, no, no dairy, no sugar, no coffee. I wasn't growing coffee, so it was quite a shock to the system. But after that week, I really started to come into my own and and actually felt quite a bit better than I normally did. Wow, and you and it lasted a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I look forward to our next conversation. 
So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. In the garden, so many. I actually was talking with Joe Lample of Growing a Greener World and the Joe Gardner Show, uh-huh. and he had a quote that kind of reframed it for me, and he said that the best gardeners are the ones that kill the most plants <laughs> because right? you have to fail. Yeah, you have to fail to adjust your techniques. And so pretty much the first time I grow most plants, it is not optimal. I do something wrong. I don't consider something or I miss a pollination window or whatever the case may be. Maybe the soil is not right. And so one one that's actually really jumping out to me just because I'm attacking this plant again and looking for much more success this year would be peanuts. I was super no. excited because I, I actually didn't know how peanuts grew until a couple years ago where they're a legume where the flowers will come out and then they will burrow burrow into the ground and then the peanut will form off of that, which is just a bizarre growing habit that I didn't know about. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to grow these peanuts, put them in the soil, didn't really think too much of it. I said, okay, I'll grow them like I grow any other legume. And it did not work out. I got five peanuts off one plant, somewhat misshapen. They were delicious. I actually made a YouTube video where I cracked them and roasted them and salted them up and I ate them and, and cherished them. But I was looking for many more and that really got me off to the the level of research I'll put into growing a new plant now uh-huh. where I'm like, you know what? We're, we're all investing minimum a month on any plant we're growing. Radish is probably the quickest one, right? Right. Minimum. That's, that's a lot of time for the fastest plant that you'll ever grow in the garden. So anything else is much longer. And so I'd rather spend that time up front and do the research. Okay, exactly what soil do they need? Exactly how much light do they require? What kind of watering? Are, are there any tasks I have to do throughout the growth cycle of this plant, you know, all that research up front now, because I don't want to fail on a, on a 90, 120, 150 day crop, right? So the peanuts kind of kicked me into that more planning mode. Interesting. So tell me a little bit more about how they grow. I've never grown peanuts before. I've thought about doing it, uh, but tell me about that. Cause it sounds different. Yeah, it's very weird. So most bean plants, the pods themselves are going to be produced in the air, hanging off the plant, right? Whereas with peanuts, as far as I know, and I've I've only grown one plant last year, but the way I've observed it to grow is that the flowers will come out as they normally would on on most plants, above the ground, off of a leaf node, right? Uh And then what they'll do is they will then fall, touch the ground, and the peanut will form beneath the ground. And so it's kind of similar, at least in looks, to how a potato would grow if you were to just uproot a potato and all the potatoes were attached. Right. They're just kind of hanging outside the root system. And that's what I noticed with my peanuts. And you know, hopefully this year I get many more and I'll, I'll see if I can take some photos for those of you who would like to check it out on Instagram or on YouTube or any of the other platforms. But just a very bizarre gro- growth habit that's almost fun to grow just because of how weird it is. But I also love peanuts, so I'm going to grow them because I want to eat them too. Oh, well, there you go. Wow. You know, I've never explored that. In fact, one of the things I want to point out is the way that I do learn to grow new things is I go get the seeds and I plant it. And that's what you've done with the peanuts. Yep, exactly. I mean, I, I really can't resist growing something for the first time no matter what it is. Mm-hmm. And so I'll grow. I'll just grow weird varieties of normal things like a, a purple lady bok choy instead of a normal bok choy or uh, any sort of colorful variety of really any plant. But yeah, if, if there's a plant I haven't grown ever before, I'm always going to just buy it and plant it or, or start the seed just because why not? Yeah, exactly. You know, I loved your intro into this where you said the sign of a good gardener is the person that's killed a lot of plants. Yeah, I would say, let me amend that though, Greg, to um, the sign of a good gardener is someone who kills plants the first time or maybe the second couple times they grow it, but then never does it again with that one plant, right? Because you have to learn from your mistakes. Exactly. But you do have to experiment enough to actually learn in the first place. Right. Well, and you you know, I've been successful right out of the chute. Yep. Not always. Sometimes you knock one out of the park. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Wow. Well, congratulations. And what do you consider your biggest success? I think I would say my biggest success is watching the success of others who have taken something that I've done and evolved it much past what I've done. So I have stories of you know a man who, I think he was 82, living in Florida. His wife had just passed, so he was sort of just really not having much to go on in life. He just was kind of despondent. And somehow he found 
what I was up to on the website, and he remembered gardening as a child. So he started going out in the garden and building himself a small little garden, and it, and it evolved. And this was years and years ago. I don't, I haven't kept in contact with him, but it was just very heartwarming to see what he said about you know, what the garden meant for him. And of course, I'm not saying I did that. Uh, he did it. But in some small way, I, I did affect that, right? Or another man who was a, a trucker, I, I believe in Idaho, who was kind of just living the normal suburban life with his, his wife and kids. And then within a year with zero gardening experience, he had found some of my work and then he had, had built a complete backyard garden and his family was eating 50% vegan <laughs> wow. meals from the garden. So just really insane, awesome stories like that that I would consider my greatest success. Just what, what others have done with, with what I've done. Yeah, well, and I, I feel like that's my job is to plant the seeds. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear you, I'm not doing it, but I'm planting the seeds to inspire others. And one of the big trips for me is when I get input from people from all over the world telling yeah, me about it's it. it's crazy. I mean, I have a video that I did with my, my good friend, Stephen. He runs a market garden out of his backyard uh -huh. called Nature's Always Right. And to your point, Greg, I think as, as communicators of, of gardening and, and plant-based living, I guess you could say, it is our job to plant the seeds. So I've, I've got a couple people who messaged, messaged me saying, I watched that one video and now I'm a farmer. I nice. used to be an accountant. Now I'm a farmer, which is to me, that just blows my mind because like you said, did I do that? No, not at all. But they watched that video and something in them transformed and they went on a path, right? Which, which to me is, is such a very apt metaphor of, of planting the seed. Yeah, exactly. So you have a friend named Stephen who runs a market garden called Nature's Always Right, huh? Yeah, yeah. Funny name, huh? Well, and very true. My late friend Toby Hemingway always used to say, Nature always bats last. Oh wow, that's a great quote and <laughs> and an awesome awesome guy. I, yeah. I know his work. Yeah. So what drives you? Oh man, I, I I think it really is the same answer. To be honest, I don't want to be you know duplicative in my in my responses, but seeing the results of what I do is a huge driver. But that's not all of it. Of course, it's not all selfless. I'm, I'm helping the world. It, it is my own life. The way I get to live because of what I'm doing is extremely fulfilling in its own. So, you know, take away all of the good feedback that I'm getting from other people who are improving their lives. Even just for me, going out and reconnecting with nature. Remember, I grew up a suburban kid playing video games, skateboarding, and, and kind of running around doing that stuff. And that, that was not the most connected to the planet type of of lifestyle and I've plugged way back into that and and I'm going even deeper into it and so just getting to live that way and actually support myself doing that is extremely fulfilling to say nothing of you know the effect that the work I do has on others. Oh yeah, exactly. You know, you mentioned a couple of times younger, being younger and you know connecting with nature. I'm looking at page 9 in the introduction of your Oh book. no. <laughs> yeah, so there's a picture of you and that's what about 8th grade maybe? I think it was, no, I remember vividly that it was seventh grade because in eighth grade, what you're about to describe, I look completely different. Oh, very good. So, inter well, and interestingly, one of my slides for my pre a big presentation that I do shows a picture of me in the eighth grade. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, I mean, for me, that is my interior self still. And for those of you listening, I have this massive parted, huge head of hair. I've got braces on. I've got massive adult-sized glasses because I have a really big head for my age at that time uh -huh. and just kind of a nerdy outfit in general. So definitely that is still how I feel on the inside of myself. Nice. Well, the cool thing is, is your grass, you know, you're, you're surrounding that. You're, you're claiming it. It's who you are mm -hmm, through, mm -hmm. through your writing. And so, yay. Yeah, it's a funny. I thought it would be funny to add that one into the into the book. Yeah, when you know it gets it gets cool responses out of people when I'm presenting and using that photograph of me in the eighth grade because I actually had an a, event happen for me in the eighth grade where I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. This was back in 1975. Oh wow! My life traces back to that picture as well, where I was. You know, I knew back then that there was something wrong with the way we were living on the planet and eating on the planet. And I, it was my job to do something about it. Very prescient for you to, to know that at that age yeah. and at that, even in that period of time, because I don't think it was really on the radar back then. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. So if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? The one that really kicked me off was Square Foot Gardening. Mm-hmm. 
which I think is what I say that that is my recommendation as you get better, quote unquote, at gardening, probably not. But as you come into the craft, I still don't think there's a better book on growing actual food at home in a no-nonsense way that doesn't require you to, again, like I said, have a horticulture degree or be a master gardener to even understand what they're talking about. So I think Mel just knocked it out of the park with that book, and and that would be my number one recommendation if, if you're starting out in the garden. Yeah. Well, and it, you know, it gives you very specific guidelines on not how to plant specific plants, but on how to design and build a garden that is in a square foot and 100 square feet, you can grow an amazing amount of food. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And just the way he lays out spacing, which is a very confusing topic for beginners, and even when and how to plant the calendar, right? Doing it over time. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who are first-time gardeners, you don't even know how long crops take to grow, let alone when you should start them and when you should take them out. So it solves a lot of the problems that, that, that most people have when they start out. So for sure, my number one recommendation. Yeah. You mentioned the word facing. Did I hear that correctly? Oh, spacing, spacing, plant spacing. Oh, yeah. plant spacing, okay. I think a lot of people run into that. I don't know if, if you've had as many questions as I have about that, but I certainly have had a lot about, okay, how far apart is this plant? How far apart are my tomato, you know? Yep, yeah, exactly. That and when to plant. I know here in Phoenix, oh, yeah. we have a planting calendar that I put together about 15 years ago on what to plant when, but that's really important. Oh yeah, it's it's it could be one of the most important things, right? You yes. do everything else perfect. If you plant it at the wrong time, it still doesn't matter. The the problem with that issue is that it's different for every single person almost, right? Like when I plant is different than when you plant, and we're not even that far away from each other. Right. So that's such a hard question to answer and I think that's why it's it's hard for beginners because they can't just go online and and find one single source of truth. They have to then understand, oh, what's my my hardiness zone? What's my climate like? And it gets them into this level of complexity that they oftentimes are just like, you know what? I'm not even going to bother, right? Because it's just too much to take on. So I think that's other thing that, that that book does really well. Yeah. Amen to that. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Yeah. So the final piece of advice I would have is think less and garden more. <laughs> so this is a thing that I always have to remind myself because I'm definitely an analytical type person and prone to overthinking. And actually one of the reasons I got into gardening in the first place was so that I could sort of disconnect from my analytical brain and just, okay, I'll play around in the dirt. And very quickly what happened is I began analyzing gardening, right? And now we have epic gardening. Yeah. <laughs> But that being said, the quicker you can just start experimenting and, and noticing what's going on, that kind of goes hand in hand. Act and observe instead of just thinking and theorizing, right? So go out in the garden, mess around, take note of what's happening based on what you're doing. I watered this much. I, I fertilized this. I pruned this. And, and here's the result. And then you draw conclusions based on that. You're basically a, you know, a plant scientist running experiments all the time is, is one way to think about it. But you do have to get out there and act and, and actually do the work. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you. I was super fun. I'm glad to be on. And how can our listeners get a hold of you? Sure. So there's a lot of different ways, and I'll run through them pretty quickly. So if you're more of a, an article reader type of person, epicgardening.com, 500 plus in-depth gardening articles to help you grow. Then if you're a watcher, you can either check me on Instagram or YouTube. Both are just called Epic Gardening. The podcast is a daily quick tips show, and that's, again, also called Epic Gardening. And then the book. I guess if you're more of a physical, in-person, you want to have that book in your hands type of person, then that's called Field Guide to Urban Gardening. And you can find it on Amazon or wherever books are sold, and we're actually giving a couple away, Greg. So yes, perfect. We'll, we'll hopefully get a couple into the hands of listeners, and, and they don't have to buy them. Dang, that's epic, man. What a deal. <laughs> <laughs> We also want to thank Kevin and the folks over at Quarto Publishing as they've given us five copies of his book, Field Guide to Urban Gardening, and they need new homes with you, our listening audience. To enter the sweepstakes, send an email with your name and mailing address with the subject line, I need a guide to urban gardening to podcast at urbanfarm.org. We will pick five random emails from the first 50 people who respond 
during this sweepstakes giveaway. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash epic gardening. We are your urban farming resource. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts are found. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.